Hi everyone. Um, I hope you are still awake. I uh, hope coffee is working. Um, so we talk about cipher-based graph pattern matching in Apache Flink. And we, that's myself, Martin, and Max, we are both software engineers at Neo4j, which is a graph database vendor that you might know. And however, the work that we present here is part of research that we were doing at the University of Leipzig. And as you might have guessed, it's about graphs, and I guess you all know what graphs are in their basic form. It's just a set of vertices denoted by these circles here, and a set of edges that express relationships between vertices. So, and uh, a famous example that we are using throughout this talk is the org book. So here, the vertices are representing orgs, and an edge from one org to another org actually means that this org hates the other org. So it's a hateship relationship. And if you are a Sauron's data analyst, you might want to ask a question like, who are the closest enemies of each org? Yeah, might be a common question inside this uh, analytical scenario. And in Neo4j, we have uh, a query language called Cypher, which is a declarative query language. And if you want to use Cypher to express this kind of question, it would look like this. You have a match clause, and you're asking for an org A who hates another org B over one to two hops. So it's essentially the neighborhood of org A that we are looking for, and return both A and B. If you want to do this uh, with Flink Jelly, for example, or the graph processing library in Apache Flink, you end up uh, doing something like this. So we did, uh, we used the Pregel API, so we implemented compute functions and we were sending messages around. And the essential part of it is uh, hidden here. So here's some filtering on some label, which is hates. And here, this two means we do two iterations. So uh, as you can see, to express the same thing, you need a lot of code, uh, much more than a declarative query. It's error prone, it's hard to maintain and hard to extend. And yeah, okay, but it gets even worse because um, those networks are typically not homogeneous, which means it's not only about orgs and hate chip relationships, it's more about heterogeneous networks. So we have other kinds of vertices, like we have the clans here, uh, we have hobbits, um, we have not only hates, but also the leader of relationship for the clans, for example, or the friendship relationships between uh, the hobbits. And then the analyst might ask, okay, which two clan leaders hate each other, and one of them knows Frodo over one to 10 hops? I mean, that's a quite interesting question. And again, in Evo J, in Cypher, you would say something like this, which is a bit more complex, but still quite readable, because what you're actually looking for is expressed in the match clause by this pattern here. So for example, in the first line, we are looking for a clan, a vertex with a label clan, and the leader of that clan, which is an orc. And then it continues. I will go into detail later. Okay, let's imagine you are the data analyst for Sauron, and you have to implement this, then probably this would be your reaction if you want to do this in an imperative way. So we thought it would be a good idea to actually uh, bring Cypher and Flink together so that you have these uh, query expressions or query um, um, options on a distributed system. And we thought that it's a good idea. Okay, but uh, let's start with some basics here. Um, so the data model that we are actually using in Neo4j and that we also use in Flink now is called the property graph model. So this is the term for that. So in a property graph model, you have, like I already mentioned, uh, vertices, which we also call nodes. And vertices or nodes have a label, at least one or more labels. And they have properties uh, in key value pairs. So which means you have property name with the value Helmut, weapon X, weight 199 kilos, tons, whatever. And you have different kinds of uh, vertices here, which you can uh, distinguish by their label. So for example, here we have the Hobbit label. Uh, here's the Hobbit label, and what you can see here, for example, that the label doesn't enforce any schema. So the property graph model is a schema-free model. So you see that tho those two Hobbits have different properties attached. Then we have the clans here, and the same applies for the edges, which we also call relationships, um, because that's what they express. So for example, a relationship is always directed, which means it has a start vertex and an end vertex, or a source and a target. So we have the hates label here, and we have the leader of label here and nose, for example, here. And as you can see in the example, also the edges can have um, properties. For example, uh, creation date for this particular leader of edge. Okay, so now what is Cypher? 
Uh, initially, Cypher was introduced in Neo4j as the declarative graph query language, which is, of course, then used in a database to insert, update, and retrieve data from the underlying database. It's designed or inspired by SQL, so there are some, uh, some expressions, especially the where predicates, which are quite easy to read if you are familiar with uh, SQL. We support pattern matching, filtering, aggregation, and projection. And at least for Neo4j, the results are multi-dimensional table, tables. It's a bit different in our implementation, which you will see later. And one thing I'd like to mention is that uh, Cypher itself is not only limited to Neo4j now. There's this thing called the Open Cypher Project, which is an approach to get uh, Cypher out in the open so that everyone who is interested in it can participate and extend the language. So there's an Antler grammar, there's a testing uh, compatibility kit. Uh, to which you can use to implement your own engine and there are all already implementations from industry partners and also from academia. Okay, so let's uh, get into the syntax. So we focus here on core features of Cypher, uh, basically the, the feature that we implement in our POC that we present here and the main features are at first the match clause uh, which describes the pattern that you're looking for. So this is where the actual magic happens. Um, what you do here is what we call ASCII art, because you actually draw the pattern that you're looking for. So which means uh, here, for example, we are looking at vertices, so the round parentheses are always uh, uh, noting vertices, which have a specific label, which is clan, and we assign those vertices to the variable C1. And then we traverse incoming edges, denoted by the arrow, which is pointing to that um, vertex, uh, with the type or the label leader of. So this is basically the concept. And then we say, okay, this uh, org here, which has the variable 01, uh, that can be reused here, which hates another org, and so on. Then we have the where clause, where we specify predicates. I mentioned that before, it's very similar to SQL. In the predicates, you can um, access the identity of vertices and edges. So, so for example, here we say that the both two clans have to be uh, different and also the orgs have to be different and we can also access the properties of uh, vertices and relationships in that example here we access the name property of the hobbit which needs to be the literal Frodo and then last but not least the return statement which specifies which fields you're interested in or which entities um, yeah so there's much more to the language this is really just the basic stuff that you can do with it there's uh, more just look up the documentation if you are interested in that Okay, so let's go again through this example to make it a bit more clear what actually happens. So uh, we just build up the query step by step so you can see what, what, what is the subgraph that actually uh, is getting returned here. So we say we were looking for clans and their leaders. So this means uh, this result would contain uh, the subgraph or the, the union of results. Um, so we have here one clan leader, here's another clan leader, and here's another one. And then we say, okay, the org, the clan leader itself, which is O1, needs to hate another org, O2. Okay, so now this one comes into play because he's hated by this clan leader. Um, this one comes into play, hated by this. And this clan isn't in the result anymore because this org here doesn't hate anyone, he's just hated by that one. Okay, but then we extend the query again and we say, okay, the, the hated org needs to be a clan leader of another clan. Okay, that's okay, that's true here. And he needs to know hobbits. And not only directly, but then there can be hobbits 10 hops away, which means there can be a path of at maximum length 10 uh, to that hobbit. We call that a variable length path expression. Okay, that's true for this org and for this subpattern. And then we can say, okay, we are also interested only in the, in the hobbit that is his name Frodo, which applies to that one here. So this is our final result that gets returned, and then we can work with that. Okay. So now um, we are getting more technical. So um, at first I want to introduce the framework that we used for the implementation, which is called Gradoop. Um, Gradoop is existing for a while. It's a third party library on top of the dataset API of Apache Flink. Um, it's developed at the University of Leipzig. And what it gives you is already a property graph abstraction on top of the dataset API. So you don't have to care about implementing labels, properties, uh, schema freeness and all that stuff. It's already there. And what it also brings you is a set of so-called graph data flow operators, which I will explain next. And what we basically did is we added 
one of these operators, which we call Cypher, which gives you the um, option to query um, extended property graphs. Okay, so what is an extended property graph? Um, it's basically a property graph that you uh, learned before. So it's just a different visualization. It's basically the same as we saw in the previous example. And it adds the concept of so-called logical graphs, which are first-class citizens of the data model. They have IDs, they have also labels, they have properties, and they are used to denote subgraphs of a much larger graph database. And you can work with those logical graphs or collections of them. And that's really important because those logical graphs are the input and the output of graph transformations. So if you are familiar with Jelly, you might know things like subgraph, which takes a graph as input and returns a graph, so we also have this. But there are much more uh, transformations available here. So for example, aggregation, where you can apply a user-defined aggregate function on a logical graph and do something with the result. Grouping, which gives you the uh, um, um, possibility to do a structural grouping on a graph to condense, to dense it, to get the inside of it. And then there's Cypher now. Okay, let's look, let's focus on Cypher and how this is, um, this is used by the programmer. So what you see here now on the lower uh, part of the slide is the Java code that you actually need to, to run this example. And, and what we do here is we use the CSV data source. So we have different kinds of data sources and this is obviously CSV. And we point to a directory in HDFS and we just uh, get logical graph and then we have an instance of a logical graph called graph one, which for this example, represents um, this graph here. We use colors to denote labels, so there are green vertices, orange vertices, very simple. Then you are interested in a specific pattern. We are looking for green vertices that point to orange vertices via orange edges. And then you say, okay, let's define a pattern. It's just a string containing the match clause of a cipher query. We say a green vertex A uh, via an orange edge with no variable to points to an orange vertex B. And then you take this pattern and give it to the cipher operator, which is called directly on that graph. So you just say graph1.cipher pattern, and the result is a graph collection. Why a graph collection? Um, because it returns actually a set of logical graphs, where each logical graph represents a subgraph of the input graph that matches the pattern. So, and all those matched subgraphs are bound together into a graph collection. And what you also see here is that we store a mapping between the query variables and the actually data uh, identifiers uh, that help you or that allow you to post-process this result. So you can say, for example, here, the variable A, which is here, maps to vertex 1, and variable B maps to vertex 2. Okay, and then you have this graph collection. You can, of course, write it back to HDFS visualize it in some way, but you can also uh, use other Kradoop operators um, to continue working with that, or you can extract the underlying data sets and use Jelly for graph processing or machine learning to do something else, whatever you want. So this is totally open uh, for you, for the user. Um, so what you see here is um, just one kind of representation that Kradoop provides. So um, Kradoop has different graph representation. This is the default one, uh, which is also used by Jelly, for example. So it's split up in two data sets, uh, one for vertices, one for edges, and the, uh, the objects themselves contain all the data, so the ID, the label, properties, and so on. And for a graph collection, there's an additional data set called graph heads. Uh, a graph head is mainly the uh, metadata for a logical graph, so the label, properties, and so on. And you also can see that the vertices now know and the edges know in which graphs they are contained. So this is the mapping between um, these logical graphs. Okay, so now that you know the internal representation, uh, that is the, the stuff that is supplied to the Cypher implementation that Max will now talk about. Yes, so now that Martin has hopefully convinced you that it's a really good idea to do Cypher on Flink, uh, I will show you how this works actually on the hood, how we actually um, evaluate a query with Flink. Um, so the approach we take is a widely largely or widely used one in most of the uh, query processing systems that are out there, more or less. Um, so of course we start with our query string, with our cipher query, and we need to transform it into a machine readable format. So we apply a grammar, and then we end up with a, a query graph and a set of predicates. So the query graph is extracted from the match clause mainly, and the predicates are both extracted from the match clause and the where clauses. Um, then 
we somehow need to decompose this query graph into smaller pieces. And uh, those pieces, again, we can actually translate into Flink operations so that we can uh, gradually build up our, um, our query plan and then actually run it on Flink. Um, this planning is actually, or can actually be done using uh, some pre-computed uh, graph statistics. And uh, you don't have to use them, but you can. And once we have this logical plan, uh, we can run it actually and then get our results. Um, so let's take a deeper look at the uh, single steps. Th um, for the parsing, as I said, we start with the um, query string and we have an antler grammar which uh, parses the query string and then we end up with the query graph. This is this one here. Um, so we assign variables to uh, both vertices and edges and then we have our predicates. To the predicates, we apply some additional transformation. In our case, we do a transformation into conjunctive normal form. This is also a standard procedure and basically allows us to decompose the query and um, evaluate uh, the, the predicates and evaluate those or, or sub-predicates as early as possible, thus reducing the set of intermediate results or the size of the intermediate results. So now before we can introduce um, our actual transformations from um, our query graph into Flink operations, we need to somehow specify a format that allows us to store intermediate results. We call this an embedding. So let's imagine we have our query graph and we have our data graph. And what we want to, fi and we and what we want to find is actually a mapping between our query graph and our data graph. And we gradually build this function. So maybe we start with this um, mapping. So we want to find all uh, data points that actually map to A, and then we want to find all data points that where, where there's a map from, where there's a valid map from A and E. Um, yes, that's basically the embedding. Um, it's also stored in, uh, all these embedding elements are also stored in data sets or in one data set. Okay, now with this in place, we can uh, introduce our uh, query operators or the translation from our query graph and our, our um, predicates into Flink operations. So we have three layers here, basically. This is the logical view. Um, here will be the um, re um, relational algebra, algebra view, and here we have our Flink operations. So at first, we start with the leaf operators. So leaf operators are those operators that take the data sets containing our actual query, uh, our actually graph data, so the vertices and edges, into our initial embeddings. So for instance, here, we want to uh, find all uh, vertices that are a, a hobbit and have the name Frodo. So we look at our uh, graph and all the vertices, and then we filter those uh, nodes that uh, have the label uh, hobbit and our Frodo, and then we add an additional projection. So this projection allows us to keep or remove um, those properties that are either uh, later needed for the query evaluation or not. So this is again done to reduce intermediate size. Um, in relational algebra, we start with the table containing the vertices and then we do a uh, selection and then a uh, projection. It's quite straightforward. And in Flink, uh, we more or less do the same. So we have our data set containing all the graph vertices. And then here we, tra we apply a flat map transformation. So we combine the selection and the projection into one operator. And um, we yield a data set containing embeddings. Uh, very small embeddings in this case. So they only contain a single vertex. OK, so now if you want to expand our um, uh, coverage of the query graph, we need to somehow uh, traverse the graph. So let's say we have those two embeddings already, or these two intermediate results already uh, um, computed, and now we want to find all clan leaders that hate another org. So what we do is we join uh, the two embeddings on uh, the common element, which in this case is uh, Azok, this org here. And naturally, this is a join operation in both SQL or uh, relational algebra and uh, Flink. Um, here, it should be noted that we also have to do some uh, combine, uh, special combine logic, because we need to um, apply some uh, distinctiveness constraints, which I don't want to go into detail right now. 
OK, so as you can see, we have two uh, input embeddings, and then we join on the common element and end up with an even larger uh, embedding covering a bigger part of our query graph. Um, another operator, yet another one, is the expand embedding operator. So this is the uh, bar length expand operator that Martin was uh, mentioning previously. So that allows us to uh, expand alongside paths of arbitrary length. So for example, we have our um, previously computed uh, intermediate result, and now we have a set of edge candidates alongside we can uh, expand. So what we do, or what we want to do is we have this org, and we want to find all the hobbits this org knows uh, over at least one and at most 10 hops. So in SQL, or uh, relational algebra, um, we could do this using an um, iterative join. And then so, so we, in, in each iteration, we join the set of edge candidates with the previously generated uh, result. And then in the end, we build the union of all those results. And we end up with uh, arbitrary paths, paths that have at least length 1 and at most length 10. Um, in Flink, we use the bulk of it, uh, iteration operator. So again, we have two inputs. We have the previously computed intermediate results, and we have our edge candidates. And then we use the bulk iteration to iteratively, iteratively um, join uh, the edge candidate set with our, our ever-growing uh, intermediate set. And again, we only yield one embedding containing all the paths, all the valid paths. So and then there's a simple operator, the filter operator. This simply reduces a set of intermediate results uh, alongside a given predicate. So we simply use a filter operation with that predicate extracted from the query. Um, yeah, so these are all the operators we basically need to express those simple cipher queries we are currently able to express. Um, now we find, need to find a query plan. So as you can imagine, um, we could start with uh, at every, every arbitrary point in our query. So we could start at every edge or even a node in our query and then expand in whatever direction we want. And every one of those plans that would result from those uh, expansions has a different cost assigned, so a different um, computational cost. So what we want to do is we want to find that plan with the lowest cost so that would run the quickest, or at least we don't want to find the worst plan, hopefully. So some, some plan that is better than the worst case. Um, for this, we use the query statistic, uh, the graph statistics I mentioned earlier. So what we do is we compute um, how many vertices and edges are there in our graph for a given set of, for a given label, um, distinct uh, source and target IDs, and property uh, value distribution. Um, using these statistics, we can assign a cost to every operator or to every operation and to every possible query graph branch, uh, logical, uh, to every branch of the logical plan. And then with this cost, we, can, uh, we have implemented a greedy planner, this which starts at the uh, leave level and then always selects the branch with the lowest cost until we have a uh, complete query plan, uh, query plan covering our complete query. Um, here you can see an example um, logical plan for our example query. So for instance here, this is a leaf node, and we want to find all edges with the label, label heights. So we employ this filter and project edges node with the uh, heights label. Um, then we want to expand this, so we want to uh, know every org that hates someone. So we have actually two leaf operators, so we find all orgs and we find all hate nodes, and then we join them using the join embeddings operator. Um, it looks quite the same for the raw length expand, so we have this, we want to find all orgs and all they know about, uh, all they know between one and ten hops, so we have again two leaf nodes and the expand embedding node. And then there, there's also a uh, filter node, so we actually want to ensure that the clans and the orgs are not the same, so we use a filter embeddings node right at the top of our, uh, at the root of our query plan. Um, this actually translates into this Flink execution plan. So here on the left, you see how we load our both data sets. So this is, these are the edges, I think, and these are the vertices. And then we have all the leaf operators. So here we transform um, 
uh, vertices and edges, the data sets containing vertices and edges into um, initial embeddings. And then we keep on expanding. This is the bulk iteration. And in the end, we end up with a single uh, data set containing all result embeddings uh, according to our query. And now Martin is going to show you a quick demo. Thank you, Max. Um, OK, so now that you know how this all works, um, we prepared a little demo um, to give you, or it's mostly targeted for data scientists that want to play around with that. So it's starting a local Flink cluster, but it can also be deployed on a real cluster if you want. Uh, we have prepared some data sets here. Graphalytics is an artificial social network containing containing persons, um, their interests, friendship relations, uh, persons study at universities, live in cities, work at companies, and so on. And we start with this um, query here. I uh, hope you can see that. Maybe I zoom in a bit. So we are looking for a node n, which is a person, and we just want to see what's around this node. So we don't know anything about the data. We just want to explore a bit. And we say, OK, we limit this uh, for demo purpose to uh, persons that start with a uh, first name Paul. OK, so let's um, execute this. You see that Flink is doing something. Um, and here's the result, uh, which is a graph which contains all the results as a, as a union. Um, there are two ways to visualize the results. So, but let's look into that here first. So here we have a person, um, Paul Johnson, who is female. Um, it's artificial data, so don't worry. Um, and what, what's around this person? So the person has interests, um, for example, in Aristotle or Orson Welles. And he also is located in, I believe, some city, which is New York. So we can see something about uh, this Paul Johnson, which is nice. So like I said, this is more like the explorative view. You can view the whole graph, which is returned by that query, and then you can uh, traverse through that and look at it and make conclusions. And then there's also the table view. The table view just uh, in each row contains exactly one subgraph that matches this pattern. So in that case, the vertex uh, N, which is a pole here, um, an edge, which is a system-generated variable here because we didn't specify any, uh, which is label nose. And he knows some female Muhammad uh, Ahmed, uh, whatever. So, and this is going on for all the results here. OK, so now um, we might want to specify some, um, some more queries. So we prepared some recommendation style queries. So recommendation is one of the most uh, uh, use cases for uh, graph databases or generally for graph systems like Neo4j. And what we're looking here is uh, at a person who studies at a university. And we, re we reuse this university and look for another person, M, which studies at the same, who studies at the same university. And they share a common interest. So they have both interests in the same tech. And we also limit this for Paul now, just to see what happens. Oh, this was, uh, I wanted to have this view, sorry. OK, so now we found something. Um, so we have uh, Paul here, Paul Frey. Uh, he's studying at a university, Geneva, University of Music. And there's also someone studying there, uh, Albert Frank and Roger Frey. And they all share the same um, interest, which is in that case, Elena Likovs Tefsla. <laughs> OK, and that's essentially two subgraphs because it, so both contain Paul uh, as the central, as person N, and then the both other persons. OK, um, then maybe if you're hosting uh, a dating website or something like that, then you might be interested in queries like this. So sh we just want to show you how you can specify predicates. We say, OK, the, person, the first person needs to be male, the other person needs to be female. And it would be helpful if they speak the same language. And I made it again. <laughs> Sorry. And I think we have some more results. Yeah, we see some nice structures here. Um, let's zoom in here. So we have, um, again, oh no, we don't limit it for poles. It's just a general, uh, it's running over the whole graph. So we have, I can't pronounce that. This person is male. This person is uh, female. Um, they share a common interest, Queen Victoria, and they study at the same university. So there might be um, 
some uh, potential for recommendation here. And last but not least, to show you the variable length path expression, it's a very basic example that we are using here. We are just looking again at persons that study at the same university and are connected by two and up to four hops uh, of nose relationships. So this is a particular large graph because yeah, it traverses uh, a lot of um, edges here. So we have the university, for example, at the center. Um, this is uh, university PPGM AP. I don't know what that is. And we have Raphael, and Raphael is connected um, to this person, to this person, this person who also studies somehow at the university. Okay. Yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, that's what we wanted to show you. So let's go back to the slides. Um, of course, this is all open source. You can uh, fork the repositories, um, play around with it. Um, okay, what's happening? Okay. <coughs> okay. So some future work that we are planning. Uh, Max already told that we implemented the Greedy Planner for now, which is a very basic approach for uh, query optimization. More, more commonly, are uh, planners that are based on dynamic programming. So we want to uh, integrate that improve the cost model and also support more cipher features. So for now, if you want to do aggregation and functions, you can always take the result of a query and then do the aggregation yourself using Gradoop or using Flink directly, um, and also support new cipher features like regular path queries, for example. So um, if you are interested in that, uh, just go to the website. Uh, Gradoop uh, links you to the GitHub, uh, which contains, among a lot of stuff, also the cipher code. Um, the demo is also publicly available, and you can just check it out and run it locally. Uh, all the data sets that we used here are also available in the demo. Um, there's already also a paper, so we wrote uh, a paper about that. Um, so if you are more into the academic description of all that, then just look into the paper, Neo4j, and the Open Cypher project again, if you're more interested into the language and what's going on there. So that's it from us, and thank you. Hi, uh, nice talk. Uh, my quest I have a, one question, which is your optimization is only done on the relational part of the grass processing, right? If I'm understanding, your, your planning, your yes, yes. only on the, okay. Are you considering to using CalSite Cal uh, and as also Flink Planner to do so? Um, yeah, we thought about that too. Um, but that would require that we actually translate it into SQL, so into to use a table API, which uses CalSite, but we can also use CalSite ourselves. Uh, but we thought about that, but we were curious and wanted to build it ourselves and try out with it. So and I, one, I problem, possible, one, yeah. one problem with the solution is that we would have to give up, most probably, I think, uh, the schema freeness. So we'd have to introduce some schema uh, yeah, restrictions, that, that which is yeah. uh, contradictory. Yeah. Thought which isn't the real cipher, at least as cipher is right now. That yeah. makes sense, I agree. Okay, okay. Thank and one you. other point is, um, for example, for the variable length path expressions, you could express this with, with recursive in SQL. I don't know if that's supported by CalSite. No, uh, but what, that was my doubt at the beginning when I saw the, 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 the path expression. I was scared that you, yep. you introduce any recursion, which is better don't. Yep. <laughs> I, th I mean, I it works if you have an upper bound, then you can always do the, it. Yeah, just that like works. An, an that's exactly what you do with the, with the self joints, right? It's, it's, uh, it's yeah. the same of uh, setting an upper bound. Yeah. Yeah, the thing is that you don't have to specify an upper bound. You can possibly say, yeah, I want a path lengths of 100 and then... Mm. Yeah, sc scary. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, nice talk, thank you. I, I was just wondering, why would I still need Neo4j in this scenario? Say again? What, Sorry. Why, would, why would you still need Neo4j? Like um, if, you're, if you're able yeah. to basically execute yeah. Cypher against... So the, the so focus of, um, so the question is, uh, uh, why do we still need Neo4j if we have something like this? So the focus of Neo4j and Gradoop, which is a system that we build on top, is totally different. So Neo4j is an OLTP database, so for operational uh, systems. So you have transactions, assets, conform transactions. Mm -hmm. This is more like an analytical system. It's read-only. You can't do updates or something like that. I mean, you create new graphs, of course, but you, you can't, you don't have any asset constraints or something like that. So that's one reason. 
I mean, um, if you are interested in that, you can have a look into the paper. We did some uh, benchmarks on mostly operational queries, which are queries that uh, touch the whole graph. So, and this is where operational databases uh, get into some problems. So if, you, if your result, your intermediate results get very large, then this begins to become a scaling problem. And for those queries, uh, our system, at least for the queries that we tried on the artificial data, worked pretty well. Um, yeah, so, but of course, there is still a need for the operational part, which Th is... That was going to be my second question. I don't know yeah. how performance-wise it compares to Neo4j. Uh, so we didn't compare it directly to Neo4j, so because that would be um, not really fair, because the one is an operational database, the other one is a distributed processing system. Um, we just, for, for our initial benchmarks, which are also in the, in the paper, where we just compare different kinds, of, so we compare different kinds of queries, so like OLTP queries and OLAP queries, and saw how the system behaves for both scenarios. So it's not really a comparison to Neo4j. Hey, thanks. Um, I know this might be a little bit of a heretic question, this being a Flink conference and all, but since that's not really a streaming problem, have you thought about uh, doing like a port on Spark? Yes, um, if you want. Um, we'll have a conference in November, uh, October, October. Uh, Graph Connect New York, where we, um, we have already announced this, but um, there will be something uh, according to Spark and Cypher there. Yes. <laughs> what a heretic question. <laughs> Okay, hello. Um, very nice talk, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering about uh, whether the full functionality offered by Cypher is supported by uh, Gradoop, because I understand that you must have done a lot of interpretation to um, achieve that, right? Like, I didn't quite ca uh, catch the question. If I try, for example, things like, um, I don't know, uh, start which mm. is uh, something you use on legacy indexes. Yeah, no, uh, is, is that something that no, we, do. we we don't support that. No. We we only support what we what you just saw here. Except yeah. we don't we don't even really support a return clause. So we always return the whole the whole matched graph. The graphs. Um, or graphs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, that you could you can of course you can express uh, the most things as Martin said already. So like things like aggregation, you can do this with a um, with a um, uh, jelly predescent uh, like no. Subsequent, uh, subsequent operator. operators, yeah. Uh, in Gradoop, um, that would be possible, but we uh, we didn't have that much time. It's only a proof of concept, so we wanted to focus on the, yep. you know, um, more basic uh, functionality. Okay. Yeah, and at least uh, from our point of view, the uh, the architecture, especially for the planner part and all the operators, it's uh, very good encapsulated. So you can easily add new functionality. So, for example, if you're interested in a not statement which might be useful for a lot of uh, recommendation use cases that could be done um, and also uh, other stuff that is also working in EO. Okay, so in, in, in the same sense I am assuming that uh, procedures for example wouldn't be supported in, uh, in, no. in this context. Nope. Okay, nope. thanks. Hi, uh, when working with graphs what comes to mind is the ability to, uh, to apply uh, some <laughs> graph <laughs> algorithms. Uh, have you thought about the uh, thought about that, like applying shortest path or clique or approximation for? Yeah, I mean, that's the, the nice thing that we are. So the question is, if we thought about applying graph algorithms um, inside the query, I guess, or after the query. Um, so the nice thing about using frameworks like Flink or even Spark is that you have access to all these other nice libraries like uh, Jelly in the Flink case or GraphX in the Spark case. So you can use the query to do your like ETL or preparation stuff. You can use Cypher to just get the data you want, and then you can easily access the underlying data sets or RDDs or data frames, or however you will call them, and then just apply uh, a graph algorithm like PageRank or whatever you're interested in um, on this data. So you can combine those libraries, and that's, I think, it's the most interesting part about those frameworks from a batch perspective, at least. Yeah. Hi, sorry, sorry me again. <laughs> uh, si si since we are in a streaming streaming conference, let's say let's uh, consider back the streaming aspect. Are you considering like an incremental evaluation of the of the query? Like uh, I want to re-execute the same query several times, like uh, happens in the streaming context, like windowing. Like mm -hmm. is that possible? Not yet. I mean, it will be possible. Um, like I mean, we we also thought about this. Um, so it. It's of course very interesting to do standing pattern, also pattern matching queries on a stream of edges, for example. 
um, because in Cradoop, for example, we also have uh, things like frequent subgraph mining, which is like a graph mining algorithm to, to detect uh, interesting patterns in, in a database that you don't know. And then you want like to register these patterns on a stream and just make an alert if they come up, something like that. So yes, uh, we, we think about this. And today there was this nice overview about the complex event processing API, which might go into that direction if it would support more complex patterns than just sequences. Um, so maybe that's a point to look at. Um, but yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> but yeah, we, will, we are thinking about that too. Yeah. It would be super interesting to have yeah. a deeper look into this. Okay. No beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay.